Well, hello, writers. Welcome to episode number 453 of Ink in Your Veins. And I am Rachel Heron. I'm so thrilled that you are here with me today as I am talking to Ashley Poston. And this is an incredibly delightful conversation. They talk about using a set schedule, perhaps for those of us who might have ADHD and stream decks and being powered by spite. Think about those words, powered by spite. They gave me permission to use that as the show title. I threatened I might, and I think I will. Uh, we talk about our enthusiasm for Rachel Aaron and a bunch of other stuff. You are going to love this interview. Why do I get such amazing people on the show? I'm so grateful. If you can hear clacking and um, anything behind me, that is the dog under my desk. She has just rediscovered her bone. She hasn't chewed it all day. Now's the time. I apologize for it. What else has been going on around here before we get into the interview? Well, I have been doing stuff. I've been doing stuff since getting unstuck out there. There's a bunch of stuff that has to come after the book gets out there. And uh, I've been working on that, really optimizing things behind the scenes. What I have done is, as you know, I launched Unstuck on Kickstarter, which was fabulous. And then I launched Unstuck on my Shopify store two weeks ago. Yes, which has been fabulous and so fun and uh, so much of an education. Sales tax, um, Nexus uh, location, where you pay sales tax, all of these things. Um, it's a lot to learn trying to figure out how and what taxes to pay when I live in New Zealand, but my actual business address is in the United States because I still hold um I hold an address there and I pay taxes to the country and to the state and uh, I've got banks there. Oh, and my bank right now, seriously annoying. My um my primary bank, which is a credit union. I have two banks that I use in the states. Both are credit unions and one is Patelco and uh they've been down. They got a virusware hack and they have been shut down for 2 weeks. There is no bank there. When you log in, there's no bank. That's where all of our money is. That's where every single bit of my incoming money is deposited to. The reason I've never moved away from Patelco, I'm just going to talk trash on Patelco for a minute. Patelco has been such a pain in my ass for so many years, but I've been using them for so many years. And I've been doing this business for, for, for 16 years. So anybody who has ever given me money, even if it's a dollar here, 20 cents there has those numbers in order to ixnay that bank account i would have to tell everybody where to send me money and that would be a major pain so i never have done it i really regret that now i will be making the change eventually and they say that the fdic has all my money safe and that nothing is lost but um here's how i think about this like i am in the position of privilege that I have moved funds, enough of them in the last month to continue living our life here in New Zealand. I have some funds in another bank that would be hard to move to New Zealand, but it could. Usually it goes through Patelco for various arcane and archaic reasons. Um, but there's a lot of people out there who just can't get their money. They just would not be able to get their money. They can go to an ATM and get a limited amount of money, but you can't go withdraw all your money, they say. And um, so sorry, sorry for that rant, but I've been doing things like this, setting up the little things, paying sales tax, uh, getting a business license to sell products in California. This is something that I'd never really thought of because I have been selling books for many years, but I've always had somebody sell them for me. And Amazon was the one collecting the tax or not collecting the tax as Amazon always manages to do or Barnes and Noble was or Kobo was. But now I am the business and I am the one selling the books and every country has different rules. All of the states have different rules as to do we charge sales tax for a digital product for an audio book. Um, and nobody has really great answers. There's not one place you can just look and find all your answers. Um, Morgana Best has a really great book about it, but but she's not going to answer the nitty gritty about sales tax. So setting those kind of things up, you can hear in my voice that I'm a little frustrated, but also it's the kind of frustration and challenge that I very much like. So all the Shopify stuff is working pretty well now, and we're always going to be updating and making things better there as I bring more and more products in to sell, move them out of KU and onto the website, um, et cetera. So Shopify ticking along, 
with Unstuck. The next thing for Unstuck, which is the memoir about moving to New Zealand, is to get it available everywhere else. I wanted it just to be on Shopify for about a month. And then I wanted to be on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and Coble and Google Play and all the places available at libraries, available at independent bookstores through Ingram Spark, available worldwide. So that's a lot of buttons and levers and things to push and pull, again, which I love, but it takes some setting up. So I'm trying to do some best practice work for Unstuck, including I have a really detailed metadata, metadata sheet. I've always had my metadata all over the place. It's in this RTF file on my computer, or it's in this Word document, or it's over here. I am just committing my life and soul over to Google Docs, which means that probably Google will kill that in a minute because Google's always killing things that I love. Um, but I have one major, huge metadata file now. And every time I work on a book to work on a blurb or optimize something about that book, I will, if it's not already in that sheet, I will add it. But here's what I wanted to talk about today is um, before uploading Unstuck to Amazon, I really wanted to optimize the categories and keywords. On Amazon, if you've never done this kind of upload, if you've never self-published on Amazon, you as the publisher or your publisher who publishes you picks three categories on Amazon and they pick seven keywords. And keywords are not as simple as memoir or um, thriller. The keywords should be very specific because Amazon... And that's where most of my self-publishing money comes from. And the biggest chunk comes from Amazon. So I want to optimize that. Um, Amazon is a short search engine. It's a really, really powerful search engine. So you kind of have to think how people are putting in their problems into the subject line of Amazon in order to find books that they don't know about yet, but want to find in order to solve a problem. So my book is about, it's a travel memoir. It's a queer travel memoir. It is also about finding happiness and about finding home and about changing your life when you feel stuck. I now need to brainstorm all the ways to make those into keywords that people could type into Amazon to try to find. And I am going to promote something here and it, I am promoting it as an affiliate because I love it. And I've been using it for years. Um, if you have not heard of Publisher Rocket, if you are in the publishing industry at all. If you are ever going to self-publish, Publisher Rocket is going to be such an amazing tool for you because instead of going to Amazon and hunting and pecking and trying to guess things, um, it helps you find what those categories should be and what those keywords should be. And I got to tell you, I just actually pulled up the page right here. So what I just told you about my book, it is um, a collection of essays gathered into a mem into memoir shape and structure, uh, travel, queer, happiness, home, getting unstuck. And those are things that I want people to find or be looking for when they find my book. I could have put in a bunch of things, but Publisher Rocket is always, or maybe they just call it Rocket now, can't remember, um, is always optimizing for how Amazon's algorithms are changing. And they don't work at Amazon. They're making best guesses of what Amazon is doing, but they're doing a lot of math and coding behind all this stuff. So in those seven spaces that you have to put keywords in or keyword strings, not just a keyword, but you can put keyword strings of up to 50 characters each into each one of those seven categories. What you could do with Publisher Rocket is you can put in category, um, uh, uh, you can put in keywords that you think people might be searching for. So I put in, I feel stuck book, thinking about a person who is sitting at their desk at work thinking, I feel stuck. Is there a book about this? I feel stuck book. That was actually, I'm going to bring the numbers up for that. That was actually not a bad one. Um, per rocket, there are about a thousand searches for that a month, a thousand times a month. Someone on Amazon types in, I feel stuck book. And according to their math, the number of books that show up when somebody types that in is saturated to the 40% mark, which means there's still quite a lot of room for books to make their way in to that category. Oh my goodness, my dog. Hold, please. I'm going to try and stop the bone noise. Okay, my apologies. You probably never even heard it, but if you did, it would have been annoying, just like it was annoying to me. Um, so if a, if a keyword, if keywords are saturated 
at 100%. That means there's really no room. There are so many books under that keyword that your book will never be seen. So you want as low as possible a percentage in there. And a lot of the things, most of the things that I kept searching for, I was getting 85%, 75%, 95%, saturated, saturated, saturated. There are so many books under this. Is that terrible? No, we do the best we can. We put our books up online. We hope that we get to tell people about it and we don't rely on Amazon to sell our books for us. We wish we could. There was a moment in about 2011 where Amazon sold our books for us. That moment is over. It's okay. There are lots of other ways to sell books, um, but it's really nice if somebody types in a keyword and they find your book and they buy it just out of the blue. So I got a bunch of I got a, a bunch of strings of keywords that I thought would be great. Here's the ones that I was kind of going for for a while. Um, best Happy Memoir 2024. Best Happy Memoir 2024. This string came to me because I put in a combination of 100 million other tries. I spent three days doing this, probably two hours a day. So about six or seven hours doing this, just punching in words to find out percentages. Did I need to do this again? No. Does it make me kind of happy to do it? Yes. But I was trying to think of um, strings like best start over books, best woman memoirs. You don't have to put in best, but best sometimes narrows the field a little bit. Um, happy memoir books. Uh, let's see. Feel good life stories. I don't call memoirs life stories, but you know who calls memoirs life stories? Readers. We call books memoirs because we're writing memoirs. Readers call them, a lot of times they call them life stories or they call them true life stories. So you're putting in those kind of words. Um, I was also putting in things like um, motivational books, happiness book, books on happiness. And most of these things were turning out to be very, very saturated. Like where's, a, where's an example of this? Um, happy memoir has, has 23,000 hits a month but 85% saturation rate. My book's not going to be seen in that. And then I was poking around on Rocket with this new thing that you can do inside their um, Amazon ads. They have a new place on Amazon ads, a new feature about Amazon ads where you can actually get them to build your Amazon ads for you. I'm not building Amazon ads yet, but I was looking at it. I was putting in books to see what keywords those books were falling under. And I found some to search I'm going to stop talking about this for people who this is just so in the weeds, but this shocked me. So um, the top three keywords that I chose, keyword strings that I chose, um, the, the, the best one I found was best-selling autobiographies. And best-selling is not all one word. I would normally spe sell, I would normally spell best-selling one word, but people who are sitting at their computers typing if they type best space selling space autobiographies, which is again, I would not call my book an autobiography, I'd call it a memoir, but that's not what readers do. That gets 6,189 searches a month and it's only 40% saturated, which means there's lots of room. So that's my number one keyword string. I would never have come up with this. Um, another one, self-improvement books women. Self-improvement does not have a hyphen. I would spell that with a hyphen. Readers don't. So self-improvement books women has 4,200 searches a month and is only 30% saturated. And best motivational books 2024 has 3,000 searches a month and only 27% saturated. And then I went on to use um, Kindle Rocket to come up with keywords that will help me get into the categories that I choose, because you can choose your categories, but will you show in that? Will you rank in that? Um, it can be useful to kind of stuff your keywords with things like, I'm I'm listing my book under um, humorous essays as one of my categories. So I stuffed in the words humor, entertainment, essays, funny, laughter, comedy. And I'm also filing my book under um, biographies and memoir slash travel. So I stuffed keywords with travel, adventure, memoir, wanderlust, exploration, journey, nomad. These are not words I came up with by myself. They came from Publisher Rocket, which is why I am telling you about it right now, um, because they have this new Amazon ads feature. If you've ever been interested in Amazon ads, they're doing a free course right now and they gave it to me and I looked at it. It looks amazing. Um, I'm probably, I will do it when I'm doing Amazon ads, but that probably won't be for a month or two, but it looks like this is a, an, it's just launched today. Um, it looks like an, it's an evergreen course. It is totally free. It's Dave Chesson, 
and who runs uh, who runs Kindlepreneur, which um, does Kindle Rocket, uh, sorry, Publisher Rocket. But it's also, he also built it with Janet Margot, who was at Amazon for a decade and built out the ads programs, the ads program for books. So she is involved in this. Um, and it looks like it's got five, um, five parts and there's about five or six parts in each one of the parts. So it's a pretty large course and um, you can get it for free by going to rachelherron.com slash ads, rachelherron.com slash ads. I am an affiliate. If you end up buying Rocket, I will get a little bit of money for it. I think you should have Rocket. It is the most useful tool for marketing. And right now, this year for me is about figuring out how to sell books. Eventually feeling, figuring out how to sell books on Shopify with ads. Although I'm moving slowly right now. I just want my books to be up on the vendors, optimized for discoverability. So um, if you're interested in that free class, which I recommend, um, it looks great. RachelHeron.com slash ads. Sorry for the ad read, but uh, I was just so excited that yesterday I finally found those categories. It took a long time to find categories that had a lot of search, or sorry, keywords that had a lot of searches, but low saturation in this nonfiction market. It can be easier in other markets to find, to find things like that, but it takes time and it takes a tool. Anyway, I'm babbling. What else is going on? That's enough for me to tell you about. I'm about to send a newsletter out about how um, proud I am of my dog, the one that was just chewing the bone, the one who is going to a new doggy daycare where she's doing really well instead of um, being a wild beast. So uh, that newsletter will be going out to people soon. If you're not on my mailing list, I would love it if you were. I'm also telling you about the uh, most recent book that I loved, um, which was so great. And that's at rachelherron.com slash right. You can sign up for that there. I am now done telling you about things. And let's talk about other things. Uh, let's talk about Ashley Poston, who is the New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of The Dead Romantics and The Seven Year Slip. They write stories about love and friendship and ever afters. A native to South Carolina, they now live in a small gray house with their sassy cat and too many books. You can find them on the internet, somewhere, watching cat videos and reading fan fiction. A novel love story is their most recent release. You're going to love this interview. Please stick around. Please do a little bit of your own writing. Please tell me all about it when you do. And here we go. Well, I am so pleased to welcome you to the show. May I please ask you your name and pronouns? Absolutely. It's Ashley Poston, she, they. Thank you very much for being here. Um, I loved The Dead Romantics, and I have not had a chance to read the neck Elliot of a novel love story, but I cannot wait to. The premise is enchanting, and we'll talk about that in a little Thank bit. You. <laughs> but um, we on this show, we talk about process, because I am just obsessed with process, how people do it, because I'm always looking for the silver bullet, which does not exist, but let's talk about that anyway. What <laughs> does your writing process look like in getting your books done? Oh, I wish there was a silver bullet or I wish there was like, you know, a hack or, you know, the 10 things you can do to write a best-selling novel. And <laughs> you know, if, yep. if that were possible, I would be out of a job. <laughs> so everyone would um, do it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Every, yeah. everyone would do it. Uh, so my writing process is kind of all over the place. For me, every book is a little different. For The Dead Romantics, I had a scene in my head that I knew I wanted to write. But to get to that scene, I had to write all of the scenes beforehand because I am one of those annoying writers who has to write chronologically. <laughs> so I usually do, too. I wish I didn't. And sometimes I play with it. But I, yeah, I, I, I envy those people who jump around. I know, me yeah. too. I, I I think my brain is like too squirrely to be able to do that. I have to like <laughs> Mine too. know yeah. I have to know where a character is emotionally to to really get into a scene. Uh yeah. and I never know that if I'm hopping around. So So when you had that idea for that scene, did did you then or in any of your um subsequent processes, did are you an outliner? Are you a fly by the seat of your pants? What what do you like to do? Uh I, again it's Based, it's usually based off of uh, what the book itself needs for the dead romantics. Um, I had that one scene and then I had an idea of how I wanted to start it. But for me, it was answering the questions of, okay, why is she in a graveyard? Who is this ghost? Um, what, what does her family look like? Why is she there? Uh, 
I hope that's your kitty. I can see behind you. Fantastic. Hello, kitty. <laughs> Yay. That, uh, that is my kitty. Um, if you, if you just heard that, um, no, that is okay. Uh, okay, good. I won't, I won't tell you what it is because <laughs> no, <laughs> no, sadly I missed it. <laughs> uh, no, it was a, it was like, a, uh, and so I, I thought, I thought very, very heroically of me that yes, I will, I will buy uh, automatic opening trash cans for my bathroom and my office so my cats can't get into the trash cans. And then my smartest, most terrible goose moose, uh, he learned how to open the automatic trash can lids. <laughs> oh my gosh. I have never had a cat that could open the trash can. I've had many dogs who could, but I've never had a cat that figured that out. That is mm -hmm. awesome. I have to say I am in awe. So <laughs> uh yeah, he uh he, he he doesn't care what's inside. He just he he just likes to open it. So just he don't will, keep like, him swipe out. his right. Just, <laughs> egg, yeah. And I'm like, great, great. There th there is a reason I call him Lucifer. Uh <laughs> Oh, that's that's wonderful. That may be part of how you write too. Do the cat do the cats help? You know what? They they sure as heck don't help, but they hinder all the time. <laughs> they Which I us, think is their point. They make us more creative in getting our work done. Yes, we are we're in the process of getting edging up to getting a kitten. We got a Ooh. we got a puppy la last year and we're still recovering from that. Um we made a big move to New Zealand and after after most of our animals had died of old age in the states and so now we're <laughs> starting the collection up again. <laughs> now you're collecting them again. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to try oh. to keep it to one in one, but um that would be that would be great. Speaking of things that help us write, what things yes. help you most to write? Uh, the thing that helps me most to write is having a set schedule to write um, because I have ADHD. I me tend too. to. Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> you understand then. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> You, you you can be zeroed in on one thing for the first five minutes of your day, and then you will completely forget what that one thing was that you were so zeroed in on for the next yes. like 23 hours and 55 minutes. Yes, 100%. And it's the worst. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I had to learn how to, um, how to function like early, early on in my career before I, I was diagnosed with a ADHD with like how to, how like by best practices of writing. Cause I've been a full-time writer for about six, seven years, no, eight. What's time uh, for, <laughs> for a long time now um, uh, for a, for at least the time of like a small child to go to kindergarten. Right. Uh, <laughs> So I had to like figure out how to meet my deadlines and how to, uh, and how to write. So I have a pretty strict schedule that I, that I usually follow at least half of the days of the week. Um, what does the know, schedule look like? Would you mind going a little granular with us on that? Oh, absolutely. Uh, so it starts off with, I wake up in the morning, I have my cup of coffee, I eat my breakfast, and then I go through my emails for about an hour and I kind of let my mind wander and do its thing. And then um, I used to have just a regular egg timer, but now I have upgraded to a stream deck, uh, which has like a button for like a timer and then it has shortcuts for like Scrivener pages and and what? and all this stuff. I know it's a it's like right right here. It's, uh, it's amazing. Oh whoa! It, yeah. Everybody, it looked like a little kind of iPad thing with lots of apps on the front of it. Okay, that is something I'm going to Google later. It's amazing. Um, and so I I have different buttons for different uh, set timers. Sometimes uh, I have one for 45 minutes, one for 30 minutes. And mm -hmm. then I have other timers for uh, for like five minute breaks and stuff like that. So I try and, and keep myself occupied. So yes. I will do usually 30 or 45 minutes, take a five or 10 minute break and then uh, rinse and repeat over and over again. And then I go and I play the New York Times Connections and I get really angry. <laughs> and then I go that back is to my, writing. That's my favorite one. That's my favorite one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so that, so I, I, I do that um, as much as I can throughout the day, but sometimes, you know, life throws you a curveball, and I can, and I can only get in like maybe one or two writing sessions. Um, I do like to body double, um, with mm -hmm. some of my writing friends. So I body double a lot with, uh, with our friend Katie Locke. Uh, they are fantastic. 
Um, and, uh, and yeah, so that's kind of how I, how I end up, um, meeting my deadlines most of the time. <laughs> when you push that button, um, d- does it do a visual timer as well? Can you kind of see it counting down or is it just, yeah, that's, that's ideal. I, yeah, I, yeah, you can. I bought something, um, uh, absolutely not the same, but just a little thing for my phone, because I tell you will understand this mm-hmm. when I put my phone onto a visual timer, I just use one of them and I put on a Pomodoro or a 40 minute or whatever, and then you can see the red clicking down. But I also, because I've put it up on this stand, I forget where my phone is. Yeah, it, it no, just, me too. <laughs> it turns into the timer. And then later on, I'll be like, I wonder where I, I, wonder where I put my phone. It's just gone. It's gone. Mm-hmm. It's turned into a timer and it's great. So. Yeah, it's like your phone's not there anymore. It's, it is no longer a phone. <laughs> it's, it's now a thing that counts down until like doomsday, right? <laughs> Object impermanence, exactly. All right, so what is the most exciting thing you've ever realized about your writing process? Mm, the most exciting thing was that if I am really pressed for time, I could actually write a 70,000 word novel in a week. No. It's, <laughs> it's exciting. That's for sure. Uh, it's, it, I bet you don't feel very well after that. <laughs> no, no. Um, if I, if I want to burn out very quickly, oh, buddy, that's how I do it. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to write in a week and then I have to take two months off because it's <laughs> <laughs> because my brain <laughs> is bush. <laughs> oh, um, 10,000 words in a day would would put me out of commission for a, at least a week. Yeah. Yep, it was a uh, it was it was not fun, but then like you learn hacks too. Um like uh I I learned I read up on Rachel Aaron's uh 10,000 yes. words a day hack with all of my, that. My my and- word doppelganger, Rachel Aaron and Rachel Heron. Yes, we're going <laughs> to we're going to rumble someday. Yeah. <laughs> uh someday. Uh But yeah, like a uh, like I I think I think when I was first starting my my writing journey, um I I came across that 10,000 words a day, like writing hack with the, with the, with the sticky the notes triangle. or postcards. Yeah. 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 And I, and that's always like stayed in the back of my mind. And then also uh, Susan Dennard's uh, one page synopsis, mm, I don't know which that is fantastic. I love her one page synopsis. It has saved uh, my career multiple times. <laughs> <laughs> I am going to immediately look that up and let's, let's talk about Rachel Aaron for just one second. Cause I have a question for you. So she's got that triangle. And she says that if you, if you look at these kind, if you look at these three things, it will up your writing speed. And one of them is time of day that you write. So you mm-hmm. kind of monitor where you write all over the course of the day, what feels best to you. And then there's the planning part where you plan a little bit just before you write. Mm-hmm. And what is the other? Oh, enthusiasm, excitement about the scene that's coming next. If you have it, if you have excitement and you have a little bit of a plan and you know you're writing at a good time for your chronotype, what in that triangle has been the most effective for you? What do you like best out of those three things? Ooh, uh, definitely the enthusiasm part of it. Um, yeah. I do not go into a single chapter that I'm writing if I'm not enthusiastic about it. And that's that's always like, an immediate tell for me that something is not working in the plot or in the chapter is if I'm not excited to write what's happening next, then I have gone off the rail somewhere. So I need to backtrack and see what's wrong or get like a second opinion on the pages that I have. Uh, and that's where my editor, Amanda Bergeron comes in. She is fantastic. Oh, she I was, love Amanda. So she was much. my first editor's assistant editor and then I just I've just been watch I was I was with Mae Chan a million years ago and um Amanda's the best oh she's so good I am so thankful to to be with her she just like compliments my my weird chaotic brain so well oh. I just had a conversation with her today about my 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 book next year uh, oh fabulous I love that um yeah so, so enthusiasm good. me too if I'm excited I can do it if I'm not there's a problem. Exactly. What? Yeah. Yeah. And finding that out and finding where it lives in your body is just so helpful. What part of writing do you struggle with the most? I struggle the most with, um, with the middle, actually. I'm, I know like a lot of people are like, oh yeah, the middle is the worst. Yeah. The middle is actually the worst. Um, I, <laughs> everyone knows it's always the middle yeah. because because like, so, so the way I, I imagine a plot is like, you have the on-ramp going up, like, like building tension. And then when you get to the top of, of that on-ramp, you have to have somewhere to land. Right. And the middle feels a little like you're a plane circling a, a runway, trying to figure out where to land or how to land. Um, and so, 
uh, that's what the middle feels like for me sometimes. And when I can feel myself circling um, around around the airport, uh, I'm like, oh, something is something is amiss. Something is wrong here. And I'm not sure what it is. But if I can't land this plane and if I don't know how to land it, <laughs> then I am in trouble. <laughs> so... So I feel that to my bones. What um what 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 do you do in those cases? What I <laughs> when when, I, when you're trying to land the plane? I will I, I I will get up and I will go for a walk. Uh sometimes I will like lay on the floor and cry a little bit because this might be the fourth time I've tried to land this plane. <laughs> Um, but m most of the time I just, I just need to step back. And then sometimes like most of the time I just need someone else to point out something that I am just overlooking because I am yeah. so like deep into the forest. I can't even see the trees anymore. <laughs> right. Uh, so, so usually that's, that's my issue is I am too close to the content and I can't see the thing that I have already written in. I can't see my own fail safe. Um, do you have trusted people that you go to that you kind of have collected around you to, to ask those questions of, or? Absolutely. I have, um, I have three, um, critique partners who I trust with my life. Uh, I, we've, uh, we've been critique partners for about my entire uh, writing career actually. Um, uh, and, and so yeah. they've like been with me and I've been with them and we, it, it, it works really, really well because they know my hangups. I know their hangups and, uh, they're not afraid to tell me, Hey, Ashley, uh, you only wrote half a book. I know you think it's a whole book, <laughs> but it's really just half a book. And I need you to finish writing this book. <laughs> Mine, mine always says, um, uh, you, did you know that you just have a premise? You don't have any mm -hmm. plot. There's no plot here. So why don't you, why don't you put in a little plot instead of that fabulous premise? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Oh yeah. And, and then when they tell you that, like you you just, you just die a little inside you're like, <laughs> but I, but, but I thought, I thought it was the plot. I thought this was the plot. No, that's just the emotional arc. You need to find a plot. And then the next thought comes in that you're like, oh, they're right. Why didn't I, why didn't I see that? Why it was right there. I, I didn't see it. Brains are weird. Creative are so processes weird. are weird. <laughs> and I love thinking about them. What are you really, really good at in writing? Uh, I know for a fact that I'm really good at dialogue. Um, I, oh I love dialogue. It is one of my favorite things to do. I come from a background in theater. I, ah. um, <laughs> yeah. Yep. So, uh, so I, I really, really love organic dialogue and I love telling stories like through dialogue tags and not just, you know, um, like an author telling you what's happening, but the characters like walking you through it as well. Um, there, there will be some people listening to this who are brand new to this concept. Could you explain that a little bit? Absolutely. Uh, so, so, uh, so dialogue can, can function both as like just pure entertainment, but it also can move the story forward. And most of the time I like to practice a little bit of both in every scene. So if a conversation is not moving the plot forward, or if you are not, or if the reader is not finding something new out in the dialogue, I, I never think the conversation is necessary. Um, I think it's just wasted, uh, like wasted space on a page and a reader will get bored with it. Um, I, I do enjoy sometimes like the the really really thick books that like kind of languish in these conversations and these scenes. <laughs> They're lovely. Most of them can be can be cut a hundred pages. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and they can be. I always find those scenes. I enjoy writing them so much, mm -hmm. and they can teach me about the characters. But I don't need the reader to learn about my characters that way. I can show exactly. them the characters in better ways. So tell me more. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, and so the best way to to tell a reader about a character is like how they interact with uh, the world around them. And one of the most surefire ways to get a character's reaction is in dialogue or in conversations. Um, so I really put a lot of like the heavy lifting on conversations. And in every one of my outlines, I usually have some kind of dialogue tag in my uh in my outlines that says okay this person says this and this person reacts this way to this because uh that's kind of also how humans interact with each other is 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 we communicate through conversation and so um what i see a lot of younger 
um, authors or people newer to writing uh, falling into is like showing, like, like telling and not showing. Um, and so like telling is basically, oh, this, this person feels this way here, but instead you could have a dialogue about that. And if you have that in dialogue, you can also go deeper into not only the character in question, but also whoever else they're in conversation with. So it's, it, it, it's character building. <laughs> Yeah. And, and I, I love that example too, of, you know, showing, not tell, or showing, not telling, not saying this person feels sad, using dialogue to do it and using the subtext to show it rather than the character going to their friend and saying, I feel sad. Um, showing yes. the character <laughs> going to their friend and refusing to meet their eyes and not answering the question about their ex and um, petting the cat too hard and making it squeak. But, you know, those mm -hmm. are, that's, that's where dialogue can be so rich and juicy and you do it so well so in good. your work. Oh, thank you. That's like the one thing that like, I know I'm like, yes, I know I am good at this one thing. <laughs> Everything else, no, you will find a billion typos. <laughs> Like, that's, that is... that's that's not our job that's our job we, we, we people are paid to clean up the, the typos that i cannot see because <laughs> they yeah because i've i i've watched i have seen this word so often i just i can't see it anymore There's, it can't be any other way i it is in my brain yes yeah <laughs> may i ask you for a um for the kindest thing that you've ever done for yourself as a writer Ooh, the kindest thing i've ever done for myself um the kindest thing I've ever done for myself as a writer is I have kept my, so I write a lot of fanfic. That's where I'd started. Um, I started writing in fanfic when I was like 11 or 12 and I just never awesome. stopped. It's yeah. like, the, it's my comfort place. It's mm -hmm. where I go to when I get really frustrated with my career and I don't know if like, I really want to write anymore. And so I, I, because like there's so many other things you can do besides this like excuse my language this bullshit career sometimes <laughs> like there's mm -hmm. there there are so many like other avenues that, that that you can take and to want to tell stories and to be in the publishing industry in in this sort of uh machine uh it's it it definitely drains you a lot and so um the kindest thing i've ever done to myself is i have kept my um fan fix uh closed no one knows my username uh no one knows who i am in my fandoms uh, that's so cool <laughs> thank you yeah that is so <laughs> cool you've got this mystery around you oh my gosh <laughs> In my head, I want you to be the fanfic author that everybody is saying is Taylor Swift. But we oh my it. God, I wish, <laughs> I wish I was. <laughs> I believe but you. you. Or I did you train be. yourself <laughs> to say that that clearly, right? Mm, that's true. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> but yeah, that's oh, the that's... kindest thing I've ever done to myself because sometimes you just have to remember why, why you're writing and it's not for... The royalties you might get it's not for like the six-figure deal you you might have in the future but it's mm -hmm. it's because you genuinely love this craft and you love telling stories and um i i i have to remind myself of that sometimes because i'm human so yeah and what you're doing that is you are purely delighting yourself and then you're purely delighting readers and there's no mm -hmm. there's there's none of the bullshit in between there's none of the industry stuff mm -hmm. Um, I am not, I, I don't like to use the words PTSD lightly or make, uh, but I do sometimes say that the P stands for publishing. <laughs> like, just, you know. uh, no, I, I absolutely agree. <laughs> there have been some things that have happened in my professional career that I um, still get anxious talking about uh, and some things that I will never talk about because it, it, there are things that happen behind the scenes that are just really demoralizing i like you so much <laughs> my, my sister i've never met oh this is awesome all right yes 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 will you please tell us about a time that you knew you had ink in your veins Ooh, um i think it was the first time that i got recognized for my writing um, and it's not 
what you think Tell uh, me. so I <laughs> so I was in sixth grade because uh, I knew I wanted to I yes. knew I wanted to write since I was like young all right yeah, yeah. Uh, but I didn't know like what I wanted to do. I didn't know what kind of stories I wanted to tell. Um, I wanted to be like a comic book artist for a while. And then for a while I wanted to be a script writer or a playwright. And, but I've always like gravitated back to, to novels and stories. Uh, so there, there is this, um, there is this specialized school in my state that takes on like very gifted uh, kids. And I tried out for one of their summer programs and I tried out in creative writing. And, uh, the, and I had so much fun, like writing my submission and I was like, yeah, this is it. I am so excited. And then, um, the, I, I didn't get in spoiler, uh, and the, one of the judges, uh, politely told me to maybe look for something else to do to inspire me and creatively. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> was, uh, yeah, it was, I was like, you you said that to a sixth grader, like looking oh, back now, I can God. realize like what utter like BS that was. Yes. But at the time I was just so crushed. And that was like, looking back, uh, that was the first time that I realized, oh, I am partially uh, powered by spite. <laughs> <laughs> That'll go a little long way in a writing career too. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> It is beautiful because what normally will happen to people a lot of times, and I and I hear this so much, is that then they never write again until yeah, they're they in their forties, fifties, sixties, and then they try, and that's and that's in them. And instead, you said, "Oh, this is for me. Let me show you. Let me show you how this is yeah. for me." Yeah, I, I and I think it was it was so easy for me to be like, "Well, you're wrong," because I had already found a community and fanfic at that time, <sighs> and so and so like I. I knew I wasn't like, I was like, I was in sixth grade. I wasn't the best writer. Obviously I wasn't. But you were uh, affecting people and you knew exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. And I was part of a community and I knew like, this is what I wanted to do. And this is like, this is the avenue that I, that I wanted to go down. Um, so basically I just didn't listen to him. I mean, I, I, I like, I, the comments are still in the back of my head still to this day obviously. of course we're talking about it now you never forgot it yeah. <laughs> right never yeah. forgot it and so like it did influence what I wanted like like the area that I concentrated on like I I did shy away a little bit from uh from doing any creative writing publicly I, I still did fanfic and I gravitated more towards theater and you know playwriting and script writing but in the end that helped me out a lot because yeah. I ended up like studying the like different four of creative writing and it it worked out so I love that story so <laughs> much every single little bit about it thank you thank you so much for sharing it yeah will so, will we, yeah please no I, I I I was just gonna say uh don't listen to the haters <laughs> <laughs> or listen to them and show them how they're wrong how they're exactly wrong. They're fueled by spite <laughs> I promise you, I will not title the podcast that, although it is very tempting. Um, Please do it. Do it. <laughs> okay, Stamp might. of approval. <laughs> oh, that pleases me so much. Okay. um, What's the best book that you've read recently and why did you love it? Oh, okay. So I am a little late to the party, but I just, I just read Half a Soul by um, Olivia Atwater. Oh, yeah. I've, uh, I've heard about it and I haven't read it. It was... uh. Like people were comping it to House Moving Castle, and I was like, what? "I don't see how. I don't see how. I don't see how." And and like plot wise, absolutely not. But vibe wise, no freaking yeah. way. <laughs> I'm going to one click today because Hal's is my favorite. Is my oh, favorite. That's my life. Uh, no, yeah. no, same. Yeah. Um, I I just I just found in my local used bookstore a first edition of <gasps> Hal's Moving Castle. <laughs> I 100 bought it. I was like, you are mine. I've been looking for this for years. Oh uh, my gosh! And it was just there, waiting for you. It was it was there. And Hal's Moving Castle by Di Diana Wynne Jones is the reason I like I I read it when I was like 
12 and I was like, this is, um, this is, this is the book. Like, this is my heart book. And I have kept to like that paperback that I had first read. And I like the Hosman Castle is the reason I am writing today. If we're being honest, uh, that's it. That's beautiful. <laughs> oh, I love that. And this half a soul has the vibe. Oh, absolutely. 100%. Okay. Um, it has, it's, it's very, um, if you enjoyed Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia of Fairies, yes, uh, yes. you would absolutely enjoy Half a Soul. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And now will you please tell us about your most recent book, a novel love story? Give us of maybe course. a little bit of a log line and what's going <laughs> on in it. So uh, a novel love story is about a professor of English literature who finds herself trapped in the fictional town of her favorite romance series sold <laughs> <laughs> right like who who would yeah. who wouldn't want to and then she yeah. might be she might end up falling in love with like the grumpy bookstore owner that she doesn't quite remember from the books and she doesn't know why but he is really hashtag a literal book boyfriend so <laughs> see that's the literal definition of high concept too that's the, when we talk about high concept people, that is like when you say half a sentence or two and everybody knows what's it about, what it's about, and is also desperate to get their hands on it. <laughs> Give it to me. Thank you very much. It has been such a pleasure to talk to you. Can you please tell us where to find you out there online? Absolutely. Uh, you can find me mostly on Instagram at heyashposton. And you can also find me um, on my sub stack, um, which I think is also Hey Ash Poston. Uh, I, I think everything at this point is Hey Ash posting, including TikTok, um, okay. because uh, Twitter is no longer a thing and I don't mm. really frequent X. Yeah, so. no. <laughs> I, I, I killed everything over there after downloading my archive, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I haven't, I haven't like pulled the plug yet. I still like update it sometimes with, uh, with like, you know, tour events and everything. I but kind otherwise... of regret. I have a little tiny bit of regret that I did pull the plug because I had a lot uh... of people over there, but you know. I, d I regret for like that half second. Now I'm over it. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Like <laughs> I usually like forget I have I have that account anymore that I had spent like fit like what twelve years trying to cultivate. And then, yeah. and then it also, I loved it. Like I cultivated it, but it was also my social media of choice. Like that's where mm -hmm. my friends were, and that's where I read everything, and that's yeah. But yeah, you know, that was I, like that was like our water cooler. It um, was after yeah. I haven't managed to replace it. And also, I don't really want to I'm kind of enjoying the break. Maybe, yeah, you know, maybe a little bit too much Reddit, <laughs> but, you know, Reddit, Reddit is all right. Sometimes. You know, Reddit, Reddit is probably the last bastion at this point. I think so, too. Yeah. Yeah. It has been a joy to talk to you. It has. Thank you, Thank you so much. So much, Ashley. I wish you the best and may it fly from the shelves. Oh, thank you so much.